You may be seated. Well, welcome. Uh, man, we already went to church, didn't we? <laughs> uh, man, so uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the same things we'll hear in the Word today. Uh, man, I'm so thankful. Thank you, uh, Brother Andy and uh, Brother Matt, for sharing. And, um, yeah, for our worship team. Uh, wow, that's awesome. Uh, a lot of the words you hear in the song are words that we'll hear today in the Word, as we said. Uh, so welcome here on this Easter. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the pastor here, and I'm thankful to have the opportunity yet again to uh, share in God's Word. Uh, if you're here in person, wonderful, because I can see your smiling faces. Uh, if you're here online, and I'm glad you're here too. And I just want to remind you, if you're a visitor with us and uh, you're just coming in for one Sunday even, uh, feel free to uh, uh, reach out to us online uh, through the email list on the website. Uh, or grab a little visitor card. If you didn't get one of those, I'd be happy to get one of those to you if I can reach out to you this week. Uh, and so while we're in Easter, we're also in our series, Why? So we've been in this series, Why? And um, I'm thankful today as we work through a lot of the why questions. Uh, I want to let everybody know my mom's here. And um, so I think about being here today on this Easter and going through series is like this, dealing with the hard things in life. Uh, my mom, Melissa, uh, flew up here from Texas and we thought, Maybe the warmer weather will come with her, um, but it didn't, so it snowed this morning, so, so you were here for the sunrise service, you got to see some of that, and um, so I'm thankful that uh, she's here, and uh, family, man, we have a lot of people to rest on reason that we're here today um, in this place celebrating uh, what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and so while we're in this series, why, we're coming to the end of it, don't be sad, we've got another one coming up. Uh, come to the end of the series, why? And we always ask a lot of questions in life. So why do things happen? Generally, we ask them about like the things that are sad, the things that are bad, and we go, God, I don't quite understand that. Why did that happen? Today, uh, we're going to ask why Jesus. So we're going to turn our focus a little bit. We understand the story of the resurrection, or most of us probably do in the room, uh, why Jesus came. And we sang about this too, that he came to live a sinless life, to die for us on the cross. And I love the words that we sang about freedom. How do we have access to this freedom in Christ? We're no longer bound by our sins. Where does this come from? It comes through the blood that was shed on the cross for us. And while when Jesus died, that veil tore, and so we got direct access to God. So we didn't have to go through somebody else. We didn't have to go through a priest. As we see in the text today in Hebrews, we see that we have this direct access because God calls us this kingdom of priests. That we all have this ability to connect with God directly. And so I'm excited about that, that we get to talk about it this morning. And so as we think about the whys. Why Jesus? And the phrase I want you to remember, it's kind of a strange one for today, uh, the goat. Goat. Now, if you've heard that expression before, or maybe you've uh, seen it in sports, um, <clears throat> well, or a few characters that it was in reference to, um, because we know that Jesus is really the greatest of all time, right? Greatest of all time for everything. But if you look at things like sports, you probably think of a few characters. I think about people like uh, Tom Brady, well, that may be a cuss word around here. Uh, Tom Brady won seven Super Bowls, right? Uh, you see the headlines, you know, after the seventh one, the go, right? Um, you think about guys like Michael Jordan. We're talking about LeBron, right? Mm -hmm. Michael Jordan, all right? So six championships. Tiger Woods, I think he played his first golf tournament. It was a couple weeks ago after his car accident, like a couple years ago. So he's won 15 majors. Wayne Gretzky, who knows Wayne Gretzky? Four Stanley Cups, right? Uh, what about baseball? Babe Ruth, seven World Series. Simone Biles for gymnastics, 30 medals. Uh, uh, Usain Bolt, the fastest man in the world. Still has that title, I think. Serena Williams, the one of the greatest <laughs> tennis players of all time. And the last one, Michael Phelps, who has 28 Olympic gold medals, 23 gold medals more than 161 countries in the world. So a lot of people would say you know, they're the goats of their particular area. But when we think about the true goat, I know the scripture talks to us a lot about Jesus being this lamb being this lion, but the truth is, unless we really view Jesus as the greatest of all time in our lives, throughout all of eternity, throughout all the expanse of time, uh, then we won't really get this right perspective of him, okay? So let's be thinking about that as we walk through the text. And as the book of Hebrews, it's written, it's written to an audience that uh, has struggled with worship of other things, worship of angels, uh, worship of uh, other characters, worship of statues, and all throughout this culture, during this time, this was right before the temple was almost destroyed. So Jesus talked about this. He, he was talking about his body when he was going to the cross. He's going to shed his blood. He broke his body on the cross for us and was raised. He said this temple, too, is going to be destroyed. It was destroyed in 70 AD, which is just a few years before when the book of Hebrews is being written. 
And the person who's writing this, whoever it is, I think it's Luke, when he writes this, he's writing to a group of people that need to be reassured that Jesus was who he said he was, and that he was greater than everything else and everyone else. And so that's what we'll be talking about today. And so if you have your fill in the blanks, if you're type A like me, you like to fill them in. You like to have something to take home with you, leave in your Bible. Um, so by the end of the year, you got 52 of those um, in your Bible. You can do a little spring cleaning. Uh, and so <clears throat> first fill in the blank is he is all powerful. He's all powerful. So how do we know this? Well, let's take a look at the text. In verse number one of Hebrews chapter one, it says, long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So what happens? We know that the book is being set up for those who are trying to understand, hey, how does the Old Testament connect to the New Testament? How does the Old Covenant uh, make sense with the New Covenant? What Jesus has come to do with, with us? Um, are we supposed to you know, fulfill the law too? Are we supposed to follow Jesus? Are we supposed to do all these rules and regulations? Well, the, the author's seeking to answer this, but first he wants us to understand how God speaks to us. And this freedom that we have direct access to God, he says, long ago. It almost sounds like you're going to a place long ago, far away, a galaxy far away. Uh, but the author here is talking about how Jesus communicated with us, how he communed with us. Well, long ago, uh, many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So we see this throughout the Old Testament as we were in the quiet time looking through the books of Exodus. We, we saw how God was communicating. He was through, communicating through an individual and through different signs and things that were going on. So we spoke to him that way. And in the Greek, the word here is laleo. It's used a lot in the New Testament, 296 times. We're going to see it again because in verse 2, uh, God's going to help us understand. Now we can connect directly to him. So how does this happen? Uh, verse number 2 says, But in the last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. So what has he done? He's spoken to us by his Son. So he spoke through the prophets, and he's got all power because now he's actually sent Jesus, and he's spoken through the Son, and this is going to give us direct access to be able to also speak for God. So he's given us power. He's given us access to this. So we don't have to walk. I, I love that we... Um, we talked about the spirit and the power that disciples walked in. Brother Matt talked about that and, and how there was something that changed. Like if you didn't, if you were an atheist and you didn't believe anything else, these guys who were very cowardly before, and then Jesus, once he got up from the grave and he gave them the spirit that now lives inside of them, lives inside of all of us, they had power. They had power, right? So God's got all the power. He's the greatest of all time. But he also gives us access to this. And how does he do it? Well, um, I'm going to look at the same word here, this laleo in the Greek, um, in another part of the Gospels. In Matthew 10, 19 through 20, I want to read that. It says, speak three times. We need to pay attention to this. It says, when they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, it is the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. <clears throat> Have you ever been in that situation where... Um, as a believer, I know we all walk into this place on Easter and we're, we're confident. And yeah, it's Easter. He's risen. So we're excited about that. But then going out into the world, like, do we have confidence? Do we have hope? Do we have this assurance? Well, here we find the book of Hebrews lays it out really clearly for us. God spoke. He had the power. He spoke through the prophets and signs. And then he spoke through Jesus who came and was that sacrificial offering for us. He gave us access to this freedom. But the other thing that he did was he gave us access to the power, Right? Like the disciples, we're able to do things that maybe we would never do outside of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, I can never talk to that person. Oh, I can never do that. I don't know about sharing my faith. I mean, that's scary. That's awkward. But what did the disciples do? I mean, and all those people that followed after that saw Jesus who, like what Matt said, they, they, they said, we can't say that he didn't raise from the grave because we literally saw him. And, and people who, who said, I'm willing to die for that. You've got to take them seriously, right? So now we have access to this power. He doesn't just say, I'm going to raise from the dead. This is going to be the sign, and I'm going to give you access to this. So he's all powerful. He's the greatest of all time. But the cool thing is he allows us to tap into this. And who is he? Well, in verse 3, it tells us he's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So who is he? Well, he's the greatest of all time. He's got all power. But he is the glory of God, Jesus. This was the that exact representation and we see here in Hebrews. He upholds the universe by the words of his mouth. And I don't know if we, we really take that into account on Easter. We're like, yes, the, the stone got rolled away. He walked out. He started talking to people. And they were like, yes. You know, we weren't expecting this, but it happened, right? So now everybody's celebrating 
We celebrate it today. But do we really believe this, that the creator of the universe, Jesus, who created by the word of his mouth, now upholds the universe by the word of his mouth? So he walked out of the grave, but he upheld everything, and he's still upholding it. So who's really got all the power, right? And we worry, we fret, and we, we give grief to things that maybe sometimes we shouldn't because we don't trust that, because we don't believe it. And when we read this, especially on Easter, when we read this, we go, wow, like God's really, he's really got everything under control. He really does have all the power. But what else did he do? He sat down at the right hand of God. And this was, by the way, a seed he already possessed. So some people will say, well, yeah, Jesus, I mean, yeah, he was a really good guy, and he came, and like, he, he was a really good model for us to follow. But the Son of God, God himself, <laughs> sitting down at the right hand of God, yeah, maybe he got a special position because he was really good, right? To do really good things and you get a special position with God. No, the world has skewed all of these things. Instead, Jesus himself, with God the Father, they were there together, co-eternal. They created. And now with, or with Jesus, he's walking through his experience on earth and raised from the grave. And where does he go? He go, hey, my seat's still there. I'm going to go ahead and sit back down in it. So he sits down at the right hand of the Father. So he's all-powerful. Keep in mind, he is the greatest of all time within all of this. Second thing is he's forever. You've got to understand in the context of who God is, and we celebrate Easter, that there was this event that took place. Yes, the, the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, which changed everything for us. But God existed before, and Jesus himself existed before, and so we're going to see why this is important. He is forever. He's eternal. He's forever. He's infinite. In verse 4, it says, Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. <clears throat> so the author is trying to help us understand. There's, there's characters, there's individuals throughout history. There's even heavenly beings who serve really specific, really important roles. But there's only one Jesus. He is forever. And then in verse 5, it says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And these are quotes directly from Psalm 2, 2 Samuel 7, and uh, Psalm 89. And when he says these things, when the author says this, he goes, you know who Jesus is. Because there are these groups, there were these sects that were going, angels are the people we should worship. There are these other heavenly beings. And we should worship those. Well, we should worship Satan. And we should do these other things. We should take these characters, these individuals that are made up and worship them. And the author is going, I think Luke is saying here to us, dear God, hey, you know how important. Like you think, a lot of people believe in angels, right? I've had conversations with people before and they believe in ghosts and they believe in angels and they believe in demons, but they're like, Jesus, like, I don't know, did he really get up from the grave? Yeah, he did. And if he did, if we believe that, then that's far more significant than believing in anything else that's existed in all of human history. So this is the thing that we need to rest on, okay? And then in verse 6, and again, when he brings the first warning to the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So <clears throat> what happened? What did the angels do? So when Jesus shows up on the scene from the very beginning, what are they doing? They're worshiping, right? They're praising God. So if we go back to Luke 2, uh, I'm going to read just uh, verse 13 and 14 because that kind of helps us understand what's going on here. Luke 2, 8, 8, I'm sorry, Luke 2, and then 13 and 14, it says, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. Praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, with, peace among those with whom he is pleased. So when Jesus is a baby, and he shows up on the scene, although he's already, again, he's co-eternal with the Father, he, he shows up, in the form of a baby. What do the angels do? Well, they can't help it, because they're like, huh. oh, the only thing we should be doing as angels is bowing down and worshiping. So the shepherds, what do they do? They got a front row seat to the greatest choir in all the universe. The angels, as they're singing, about Jesus says he's there. Hey, the baby's here. You need to go see him. He's more important than we are. And uh, then in verse 7, we see that it says here about the angels. What does it say? Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. What does he make his angels? This pneuma in the Greek is wind, this wind, a powerful force. So uh, this doesn't take away from what their presence is, what they're doing in the world. But he's trying to highlight something for us. So his angels, they're, they're this winds. And its ministers are what? It's flame of fire. I don't know if you've been looking at the quiet time the last couple of days in Revelation. It talked about this priesthood, this royal priesthood, like we see in 2 Peter, that we belong to God's family. But he's also, because he's given us the spirit, 
because when Jesus died, he tore that veil and he was direct access. And when Jesus ascends, or he was about to ascend, he's meeting with his disciples, he goes, here's the Spirit. And at Pentecost, what happened? The Spirit was given. So what happens here? Well, we are included into this royal priesthood of believers. And so now we have direct access to God. We don't have to go to the priest and say, here's my lamb, and here's my whatever offering. Um, please offer this up, and hopefully that will make things right, and I can be in right standing with God, but I don't get to communicate with him directly. But what do we get to do? And we take it for granted, don't we? Every single day we wake up, and we think on Easter, like, you know, I'm getting all the messages like, he is risen, you know, which is awesome, by the way. Don't stop doing that. But what do we think about the rest of the year? Do we wake up in the morning and go, he's risen? Or we go like, where's my coffee? <laughs> oh, I have to go to work again. Oh, the kids aren't ready. Wait. <laughs> all those things go through our mind, and we're going like, we, every day are we going like, he's risen. I mean, the angels knew it, so that's why the authors go, hey, they, they knew who he was, and he's included us into this royal priesthood. I love the quiet time from yesterday. It talks about this in Revelation 1, 5, and 6. It says, and from Jesus, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his what? His blood. And he made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So John's sitting on the island of Patmos. He gets the word. What does he say? What does Jesus say? The first thing he says to him, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the rulers of kings on earth, to him who loves us. And how has he loved us? Well, unconditionally, and he's freed us from our sins. Isn't that great? We've talked about that a lot in this series. When we ask questions like why, we just get so bogged down. But what has he done? He's freed us from all the bondage. He's given us freedom, right? So we don't have to walk in that. But what has he done? He's made us a kingdom, priests to his God. And Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And so we should walk in confidence with this, but but I think like when we read this, we should just think like, oh, it's your job. Like ministers, <laughs> flame of fire, right? That's cool. But he's given us access to all of that. And, and I, I think that we maybe at times we discount our ability or we downplay ourselves when it comes to our interaction with other people. Like we're part of this royal priesthood, and God is giving each of you an opportunity as believers to be that priest in somebody else's life, to go and to minister to somebody else. And you guys have done it for us too. I mean, the last year things have been tough at times, right? And how do we do that? We minister to each other, but we also minister to a world that's lost and dying. And when we go out, and we're in those places where we know our friends, our coworkers, our classmates, right, students? You know, they don't know Jesus, and they're lost. And they're going to be separated from him forever in hell. And we have this opportunity to go, hey, guess what team I'm on? Yeah, royal priesthood, belong to God, a part of the family, and I've got the spirit of God living inside of me. So that gives me power to do what? To just have a conversation. Sometimes it's hard, but he's given us confidence. So we don't walk in that bondage. He's given us freedom. So what do we have access to? Well, this flame of fire. This actually was in the quiet time um, too, the last couple of days in Revelation 1. Today is 1.14. <clears throat> the hairs of his head were white. He's talking about Jesus too. Like white wool, like snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. So what does God give us direct access to? His power, the spirit, and all these references to fire. If you look throughout like the Old Testament and the New Testament, how did God speak to Moses? The burning bush. <laughs> how did he lead the people of God? We've got this pillar of fire. Um, and so you see this throughout the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament, there's this spirit of fire that's given. And it's a spirit that's given to us that we are able to, like in the Greek here, it says this flame of fire, this flux core. And, and I think we discount it too. Like we think about how weak or how unable we are to carry out God's will or do things that he wanted, wants us to do. We can give him power, right? And on this Easter, we're like, the stones roll away. Jesus is not in there. What does that give us the ability to do? To commune with God directly. Every single day. Like, don't, when you leave this place, don't take that for granted. Like, you could get up and you could go to God. He's like, yeah, I'm here. And I do with them, um, with our kids. Um, you know what happens? Whenever somebody wakes up in the middle of the night and they're young, yeah, yeah. Like, what am I doing? I'm like, go back to sleep. Do I, or do I just leave them alone? Do I not go in there, right? Most of the time, I'll go in there and I'm like, what's going on? I have a bad dream. I say, oh God, oh God, how can I? How can I help you? Can I get up? No. I'll talk to you for a second and then go back to sleep. All right? And so just like that, God who is a perfect father, right? He hears us every single time. And he's run. He's going like, here. What do you have to tell me? So he's forever. And he gives direct access to him, which is awesome. And through that, we have confidence. 
We have power through the Spirit. It's amazing, and it should be to us. And in verse 8, But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. This is a quote from Psalm 45. So um, this is talking directly to God. His Again, his foreverness, his eternity, and, and Jesus who, before he even came, was eternal and stepped. I mean, can you imagine like like Jesus? When we think about the gruesome things that happened to him in the crucifixion on Easter. We're like, yeah, let's forget about that. He rose. Let's not think about it again because that is not even fun to think about. Right? It's not. <coughs> and so when we when we think about this and we think about God being forever and Him like being in heaven and going like, I know what the plan is. I'm gonna step into the world. I'm gonna die a gruesome death. Yes, and I'm gonna raise. We're gonna conquer sin and death, God. Like we're doing that together. The Trinity is up there. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are ready to go, and they do it. But can you imagine stepping out of eternity, stepping out of perfection, putting on flesh for us? Now, we experience it every day, and so we're like the ailments, like my foot hurts all the time, my head, my head. Right? Yeah, you know, it's like the, the ongoing things that are just minor. And Jesus stepped out of eternity to be hung on a cross and die for us and then get up, right? I know he, that's what he was looking forward to. I'm going to conquer sin and death while I'm here. I'm going to deal with the difficulty right now. But he's able to empathize with us too. Can you imagine that being forever, being eternal, stepping out of eternity and dying for us? It's amazing. So he's forever worldwide. Also because it says here in verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Why is Jesus the greatest? Well, God confirmed this to us. He anointed him. What did he do with him? Well, he, he sent him to die on the cross for our sins. So like this freedom that we talked about was accessed through the blood that was poured out. But God, before the foundation of the world, what did he do? He goes, here's how we're going to rescue him. And we're going, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, we don't know what we're going to do tonight. Like, can we get groceries? Like, what's going to And God's like, before the foundation of the world, I saved everybody. Now, we were waiting for it, right? Mankind was waiting for it. We live on the other side of it. So we're like, yes, thank you for our placement in the world. God, but God, he's going, hey, with this oil of gladness, he's anointed the son. All right. So here's the last last fill in the blank. It'll be short here, probably. <clears throat> he is the Alpha and Omega. Now we should know this. We see this throughout the scripture. But here we're reminded of it. It says in verse 10, because he created here. Uh, it says in verse 10, And you, O Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Like, do we... Like, how seriously do we take this? We think about him being Alpha and Omega, and like, he showed up, and then he lived a sinless life, and he died for us. But he was, we'll see this in Revelation, we'll read another text at the end of this, but he was, and he is, and he is to come. And this is who he is, and this is essential to his nature. So if we don't believe this about Jesus, then, then how could we believe anything else, right? He was the only one who was capable of coming to us and living a sinful life, like a sinful, sinless life. Nobody else could do that for us, right? <laughs> you may have tried. It hasn't worked out, right? <laughs> but Jesus has done that for us. And he built this foundation. It's a foundation that he's going to roll up on his own. Like, nothing's going to fall apart. Nothing's going to crumble before he allows it. And a lot of times we go like, oh, no, this is, like, bad things happen in the world, don't they? Right? We're praying to people even in Ukraine right now. And there's things that we just don't understand. And we're going like, God, what are you doing? Like, I feel like things are just going to fall apart. And, and here, here's what he says. You lay the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of your hands. It's not like a man-made structure, right? I think about things that have fallen apart or collapsed that man builds, because that happens, right? Um, and it's at an unforeseen time, too. Like, Jesus is going, hey, here's the appointed time. Where we're going to see, he's going to roll everything up. He's going to go from creation, earth, universe. He's going to go, your heavens, your work. He's going to be present for us. What was he going to do? Well, I, I was reminded about this when I was reading this. He laid the perfect foundation. He lays the foundation that when he's ready to pick it up and restore everything, he does it in a particular way at a particular time. You know, things that collapse, things that are, I think, um, sad for us, too. I think about the um, Surfside condo collapse that happened in Florida. It was less than a year ago, I think, that happened back in June. <clears throat> it collapsed in the middle of the night, 1.22 a.m. in the morning. 98 people died. You think probably most of those people were sleeping, Right? Uh, what's what's something to be awoken to? Uh, collapse and death. But what does Jesus do? He goes, I laid the foundation. It's a perfect one. And when I'm ready to roll it up and restore everything, even though there's suffering, even though there's pain and difficulty now, it's not going to happen until I allow it, until I appoint it. We're surprised by things. We don't understand things. Things happen. We just go, what happened? Faulty builder. Like, 
bad codes or whatever it was that Jesus stood you before how he laid this perfect foundation and he saved us so we don't have to rest in anything else like when those kind of things happen we go oh why and then we can rest on the truth of what he's done for us so the foundation we'll see he's gonna what is he gonna do with it well in verse 11 it says they will perish but you will remain they will wear out like a garment we've all had garments like that right I think guys have more trouble with this like we wear things until it's like okay that's not okay you should stop wearing that, right? How the ladies are like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The guy's are like, nah. I get a little more use out of it, right? So I, I, I guys, I'm in it. Like, I wear things beyond the point that they should be worn, all right? So I got, like, a shirt. It's getting holes in it. And I'm like, but I, I don't like it. It's, like, one of my favorite shirts. But she's like, throw it away. Throw it away. <laughs> she had to say it to me a few times, right? And so when we read this, it says, they will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. So what what is everything we have in life? Like our physical beings, our flesh, our garments, all the stuff it wears out. Like we wish it wouldn't. Like I'd wish the car would not break. Like stuff would not happen to it. You got to fix it. And you're like, did he just like stay perfect? Like from the moment we drove it off the lot, that would be excellent, right? But that's not how it works, right? So we live in a fallen world. So Jesus says, hey, I've I've laid this foundation. I've come and I've lived this sinless life for you. So you can accept it and follow me. And there's all these other things in this world that at the right time, I'm going to roll up, right? All that sickness, all that death, all those annoying things, car breaking, clothes wearing out, got to get new stuff, and it wears out again. It happens. This the cycle forms, right? But Jesus, he's laid this perfect foundation, and when he's ready to take it down and establish the new one, it'll never be taken down, right? And it won't be, he won't be surprised by that. He's got this appointed time for that to take place. Uh, so guys, throw out the holy stuff, okay? I mean the stuff with holes, not the holy stuff. Keep the Bible, throw out the holy shirts, right? Um, <clears throat> so, because it wears out, right? Some of these things wear out and we expect them to too when we don't want them to. And in verse 12, it says, Like a robe, you will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same. And your ear, your years will have no end. I love this word here in the Greek, the, um, the klepo. Um, there, there's literally no end to leave, to cease, to stop, to fall away. It's used just a few times in the New Testament. In Luke 23, 45, it says, While the sun's light failed, and the curtains of the temple was torn in two. So there's just no end. It didn't fail, right? God hasn't failed us. Because you know what did fail when Jesus died on the cross? That temple veil failed, didn't it? <laughs> when he died, this massive veil just got ripped in half. There's a reason that that happened. Because what? We have direct access to God. We have access to the power the Spirit God's given us. He's all powerful. He's forever. He's the greatest of all time, right? We get to rest on that. We we don't have to like wake up in the morning and go, oh no, how am I going to make things better? How am I going to make things right? Because we all struggle with that, right? The to do list, the things we have to do to make things better. But what what's what's happening with it? The garments, the world, things are breaking. They're falling apart. And Jesus knows, hey, there's this appointed time. I'm going to make all things right. What am I going to do? I'm going to, I'm going to roll it. He's going to roll it up like a carpet. The universe. He's going to establish the new heavens and the new earth. It's going to be this perfect thing. It's never going to fall apart because he is the greatest of all time. He's the Alpha and Omega. And in verse 13, it says, And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And we talked about that this morning, too. In Psalm 101, it says, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, God says, the Father says to the Son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And what do we do? I mean, we we worry, right? We fret. That's part of being in a world that's fallen, right? The um, something happens with the car. We had a little lock on the van break, and I was like, I can't get into the car anymore. Like, what's happening, right? So that had to be fixed, didn't it? Like a lot of things do. And so he says, Hey, look. The father says to the son, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So what did Jesus do? Well, he conquered sin and death, and so he's making everything right. So when we have these little annoyances, things that go on that discourage us, and we go, but I don't know how I'm going to, what am I going to do with that? How am I going to make things right? Sometimes we aren't always able to in the fallen world, but do we rest back on Jesus who conquered everything, who when we are looking at this expansive time, we go, man, he's all powerful, he's forever, and he's the Alpha and the Omega. I'm going to close that with this, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Who's to inherit salvation? Us. 
uh, his people. And it's available to all people too. If you didn't know that, um, anyone at any time can put their faith and trust in Jesus. And what are the angels sent for? Not to be worshipped. Uh, the writer of Hebrews is reminding us because others sent for the sake of God's people, his priesthood. Right? They were created for that purpose to help us. And so I want to close with a video. We've got a little bit of time. Um, I'm going to show a video, and um, we'll close with another passage in Revelation. So take a look. said that all roads lead to God, and this makes a certain amount of sense. In life, there are a thousand different ways to get where we're going. Winding scenic paths, wide, fast highways. We can walk or ride, drive or fly. Wrong turns and detours may slow us down, but sooner or later we make it. We get where we want to go. Could it not be the same for our souls? We all search for meaning, for fulfillment, for purpose, for God. But we come from different places, we're different people, and we don't all travel the same roads. But surely, if we try our best, if we follow our heart, if we believe in ourselves, we'll make it. Everything will work out. We will find salvation in the end. But there is a flaw in this way of thinking. The path to God is no road at all. It is a person. His name is Jesus. And salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No matter the road we choose, at the end of this journey that we call life, there stands a gate, shut fast. It is not opened for good people. It will not budge for those who lived right, or loved well, or did great deeds. It will only open for those who put their faith in the Son of God. Those who in life called upon the name of Jesus and believed him when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So, there's a lot of people that would claim to be those in the world. There's a lot of people that would give accolades to those who have existed. <clears throat> but who's the greatest of all time, really? It's Jesus. We celebrate that today. There's been a lot of other figures, people who have existed. Statues have been made. They've been broken down over time. And all the rest of them will be broken down. There's no figure in all of the world and all of time that truly deserves that title, the greatest of all time. And I don't know, maybe maybe you're here today and you, you've not really come to that realization until maybe now. And so you're trying to figure out, who am I going to put my trust in? Who's the only way to get to heaven? The scripture tells us that you'll have one life to live, and there'll be the judgment. And you'll stand before God, and there'll be this opportunity. God will say, hey, why should I let you into heaven? Because I did good things? Because I helped people? Because I was generally likable? No, it's not going to be the answer, is it? The answer is if you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you've given you your life over to him. If you haven't made that decision, it's as easy as this, admitting that you're a sinner, believing that Jesus is who he said he was. He died on the cross for your sins. He was raised from the dead. And you confess with your mouth that he's the Lord of your life. The scriptures tell us you'll be saved. I want to close with one passage in Revelation from the quiet time yesterday. In Revelation 1, 5 through 8. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his what? His blood. And made us a kingdom, priests, 
and his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with the clouds. Coming back. Remember that. And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. So where are we going to put our trust in today? I hope you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you haven't, uh, I'd love to talk to you about that um, afterwards. I'll be here. Uh, if you're online, feel free to reach out to us. I'd love to connect with you that way. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we come to you today on this Easter, and we celebrate um, the amazing things that you've done. But the most important thing is you lived that sinless life for us that we couldn't live, and that you died on the cross for our sins. You gave us access to your spirit. You gave us access to freedom, um, not bound by our sin. Because of that blood that you poured out on the cross, God, our blood is not worth that. It's not able to save. Your blood was and it is. Uh, God, I, I thank you that you um, allowed that to happen, that all the sins, past, present, and future are covered. That we don't have to walk in that. God, we know that you're all powerful. You're forever. You're the Alpha and the Omega. Let our hope uh, rest on that and not anything else. You're the greatest of all time. Let us keep you in that position of authority in our lives because you already are there. Help us to live that way as we leave this place. And it's your name we pray. Amen. Love you, church. Have a great Easter with your families. <laughs>